Hey guys, and welcome to another Walk-In Wednesday. As you can see right in front of me are some uh, 1902, very rare, 1902 Luger carbines. Now I just did a video on commercial guns, um, and many of you watched that, and you can see that I had an array. It was one collection of commercial guns starting with 1900, went all the way up to World War II in 1940s. One of the guns not included in that collection was a uh, a Luger carbine. Now, I have not owned too many of these. In fact, I think only one has gone through our shop. But uh, this week, we got two uh, Luger carbines. Both of them are 19 model 1902s. Um, and why don't you come, uh, come a little closer and let's take a look at these. Again, if we uh, go back uh, to the previous video, I said uh, one thing about the commercial guns. They usually are in very good condition because they never went to war. Um, these in particular were uh, purchased by probably wealthy individuals. Uh, many of them came to America um, because uh, they were made, uh, these in particular were made in like 1904, 1905, even though the model is considered an O2. What's unique about the O2, um, you see the dish toggle. They did make a 1920 carbine, and if you look at a picture of a 1920, in fact, it just has a standard toggle. Um, those are a little less desirable because they were put together for the commercial market from leftover Luger parts at the end of World War I. So again, World War I, um, the economy was destroyed, so DWM, DWM who makes these um, in 1920, were trying to create more of a market, uh, so they made some, but they're a little bit dubious because they were made from leftover parts. Uh, but let's go back to the O2, a little more desirable. We have two that are O2, you see the dish toggle. You can see that they're in beautiful shape. And um, the whole idea of a carbine is not at all unique. In fact, all the way back to the Civil War, you can see Colt carbines. Um, basically, they would take a Colt, um, and in this case, a, a, a Colt revolver, extend the barrel, and then add a stock to the back and it makes a carbine. Now the reason that that was popular and a lot of different makers made their own carbines. Here we see the uh, somewhat famous Red 9 uh, gets its name and went to the military in 9 millimeter. Um, and this is the stock. This is the Red 9. Um, the stock serves as a holster and would go around your waist or across your chest. Uh, perhaps sometimes, sometimes just hanging here or across your chest, but um, the Red 9 had a stock, and this is commonly called the broom handle Red 9. Again, made for military. Look, you can see how beautiful this is, fire blue. Uh, and the stock attaches to the back. Snaps in place, and then you hold it like this. Now again, I started to say, this is not a unique idea. You can actually hold it with one hand. It's a little bit too bulky to be a pistol and a little bit too flimsy to be a rifle. But uh, if you remember your Civil War history, uh, they were usually uh, using muzzle-loaded rifles, um, which took you know 30 seconds between shots, maybe more. I'm not, not clear on my facts on that, but it took a while to reload. Toward the end of the war, they, uh, they ca uh, came up with the Spencer carbine, um, and that was a new invention. That carbine in particular was still a single shot, um, whereas they did have the Colt revolver, six shot revolver, which um, would shoot six shots in a row without having to reload. So the pistol technology was ahead of the rifle technology. And that's what made people say, well, why can't we take the pistol and turn it into a rifle, extend the barrel a little bit, which helps with uh, distance shooting, um, and then add a stock to it, uh, which would make it usable, similar to a carbine, same size, but again, a little bit flimsy, and probably an idea that never really took off. And I guess the analogy would be, it'd be like a tablet. Uh, I have my cell phone and I have my computer, but I don't use my tablet very much. It seemed like a good idea, but sometimes <laughs> if you want a small uh, pistol, around your waist, this is not it, or this is not it. Um, if I want my rifle, I'm looking for a um, self-loading rifle. 
the most popular carbine ever made was the M1 carbine, one of my favorites, uh, used in World War II and million of, millions of those. And by that time, they really uh, perfected a 15-shot carbine, which was a little bit of uh, it was smaller than a rifle, but certainly uh, more utility than a pistol. So let's take, a, uh, let's take a look at these 1902 Luger carbines. Um, again, you can see a, a beautiful gun is built around a pistol. So this is just your typical DWM Luger in a 1900 or 1902 style. Uh, it does have the grip safety. Remember when I did the last video, I talked about the grip, grip safety, which went away in the uh, 1908 model, did away with that. Uh, it has an attachment lever right here. Um, push the attachment lever down and this just rotates off. Pretty simple design and absolutely beautiful stock. You can see the stock is numbered with the last three digits right here to match the gun. It has uh, two screws in it. The earliest models only had one screw but they found that it wasn't uh, secure enough so they add the extra screw. Now the woodworking on this is um, Absolutely beautiful, the checkering. Uh, this is actually horn. You can see some of the coloration, but you also see little uh, holes from the, the bores. Uh, and um, beautiful little design. This one has the same, similar, even more coloration. A uh, little bit of a design. Uh, but beautiful checkered wood. Slightly different color between the two of these. But um, you can see why these were not used by the military. The military were just all about uh, utility use. Like the artillery, again, in previous videos, we've talked about the artillery Luger, and they have a sight that goes from 100 meters up to 800 meters. But the board looks like this. Now, it is, it would be numbered to the gun. This one is not matching, but uh, it has the two screws. It's a similar design. It has similar attachment, uh, and it fits it rotates onto the back, very similar, very easy. But it was, uh, you can see the imperial proof right here, which means this went to the military. This is uh, dated 1917. So it's a World War I artillery. Uh, this makes it into lock it in place. But you can see that this is just a, a, a very simple board and works fine as a carbine and a lot cheaper. Um, these are about twice the price. And since they made them before World War I, they were trying to create a market, particularly uh, in Germany and the United States, where the two biggest buyers, they were trying to create a market for a very nice um, self-loading carbine that was used for hunting, by the way. Actually, some of the famous people who owned them, uh, Teddy Roosevelt had one, and he actually took it to Africa. I don't know that he ever shot it in Africa, but we know that he took it to Africa to go hunting. But in fairness, he had a lot of guns. He was a gun collector um, and had a lot of guns. Also, Hiram Maxim, the inventor of the Maxim machine gun, an American inventor. He invented a lot of things, but most famous for the Maxim machine gun. Uh, you can see here, uh, here's a picture of him, and there's actually a YouTube video of him shooting his first uh, machine gun. Uh, but he was the inventor of the machine gun, and he special ordered from DWM uh, a presentation carbine that has his name on it. It was recently sold at Rock Island. Here's a picture of that one. It went for a lot of money, uh, mostly because the attribution to Hiram as opposed to the actual value. So the good segue into what does one of these cost? Um, they can be anywhere from $10,000 to $20,000, depending on condition, and of course, uh, making sure they're all matching. So let's do that next. Let's make sure this is all matching. So the only number we know of from here is 109, and we already know that that hooked on very easily. Just like most commercial guns, the, the, ma the correct magazine will be blank on the bottom. Uh, they will have blank bottom. Oh, by the way, they come in 30 caliber. There were about a little over 2,000 of these made, uh, the model 1902. I'm told there are a few nine millimeters, um, but I've never seen one. So the vast majority are gonna be 30 caliber Luger, um, and there are uh, just over 2,000 of these made. So it has blank bottom mag, both of these mags. Uh, we can see our blank bottom. We'll take those aside. 
Let's take this one, on, take the lock off. You can see the grip safety. We rotate that off. It actually comes off very simply. Um, and then this one is also numbered. We're going to just make sure they're all matching. Uh, the next piece is a little trickier uh, because there's a wedge and it reminds me of the uh, single action army Colt. So with a little punch, you can push on this end and then this pops. This is the wedge comes out. And I just noticed that's, that's like a fire blue. This thing is gorgeous because the fire blue is still, still on the wedge. Then I just pull this back and down and it comes off. Now it is numbered on the inside and you can see 109. So that's matching. So we know this piece is matching. Uh, there is a little uh, metal piece of metal here that butts up against here. This gives it a little extra strength. So this piece of metal has a little spring in it. So it holds it in place here. And then this is uh, a reinforcement bar on the frame to hold this in. And we'll take a look. That's where the serial number is. So you have to take this piece off to get to the serial number and you can see the full serial number. And by the way, the, uh, the 1902 carbines fall in the serial number range of 21,000 up to about 24,000. And again, there's a little over 2,000 of these made. So they weren't all carbines. So we can see that this is probably one of the later ones made. And um, beautiful barrel uh, adds to the accuracy. They have it calibrated up to 300 meters. This, this rear sight is unique to the carbine. It's different than the Navy sight, which is back here. You can see how it, it's different than the artillery sight. So that's uh, a unique rear sight for the carbine. You notice the small parts are strawed. It has beautiful grips. Uh, there's not much uh, else numbered. And um, taking this apart is just like the Luger. Push back on the barrel and then this will this takedown lever. If it's not pushed back, this takedown lever doesn't come down or it's very hard to come down. You'd have to pry it down, which is uh, not the way that's designed. So all you do is push back, pry this down, side plate comes off. Once you have the side plate off, you can see this just slides forward. Now you will see the inside is in the white and it should be. If this gun was refinished, um, all of this white inside would be blued. Same way in here, if I took the firing pin out, the firing pin would be in the white. Okay, so we, this, this first one, which I consider the nicer of the two, better condition, um, we now know that it's all matching, but just as a refresher course, let's go through this one uh, really quickly. Uh, we have a blank bottom magazine, we have a dish toggle, we have straw parts, um, this slides down. We see the numbering here is 450. We pop the wedge off. Let's see if this one is fire blued. Yep, this one's fire blued as well. It has the unique rear sight, only found on the carbines. This then pulls back and down, slides right off. This one is uh, numbered in here, but it's very lightly struck, but it does say 450. So this matches this stock. And then the full serial number, we can see that this one is 24,000. So again, one of the last one made. So again, I said uh, 21,000 up to about 24,000. It goes all the way through to at least 24,500, but that's the approximate serial range. So this gun is also all matching. So I'm gonna put the, uh, I'm gonna sum up, but to put these back together, by the way, this is called the coupler or the hanger for obvious reasons. And it's got a hook right in here. So if you try to put this Luger back together, that's, that's really not tricky other than the, the coupler or the hanger. Uh, tolerances are very tight, by the way, um, which unlike many guns, they're just like individually fitted. You wanna look down inside here and make sure that the hanger hooks. And when it does, that creates the tension. You pop the side plate in and close it down. And there you go. See that? It's got the spring in it. And I just pop this back on and close the wedge. And voila.
we're all back together again. Now, just one more thing that this came with. Uh, many of these come in original boxes. You can see pictures of the original box. It comes in like a suitcase. They do, meet, they do make replicas of this box. So the replicas are available, but the original boxes can sell for, uh, I, don't, I don't know, four or $5,000. But what this did come with, uh, very, very rare, uh, more rare than the gun itself because the leather comes apart. But this is a, uh, this would be what I call a gazunta. Some people call it a holster, but uh, this goes into this, and this goes into that. So now you see how it gets its name. So the, the uh, leather is rarer than the gun itself. Uh, most times I see them in a suitcase, so I was really uh, happy to see it come with the, uh, the holster gazuntas. Great stuff, you guys. Thanks for watching. I'm proud to bring these to you. These won't last long. Uh, we'll put them up on the site and they'll sell very quickly because they are rare. Uh, make sure you like and subscribe to our videos and uh, hit the notification bell so that you're notified next time I post a video.